How many of you cannot remember what you did yesterday? <laughs> well, you're pretty good. All right. Anyway, <laughs> happiness uh, is the topic. What I plan to do is give you a uh, crash course in the psychology of happiness, which is a different topic than gratitude, but it's got a lot to do with gratitude, or rather gratitude has a lot to do with happiness, um, but that's about all I'll say about gratitude today, because there's a lot to say about happiness. You know, once upon a time, it was thought that happiness as a scientific topic was a little bit on the soft side, you know, a little bit uh, flaky, kind of optional, uh, a luxury to study, you know, as psychologists, we did pretty good with uh, the dark side of life, right, with depression and despair, uh, disease, dysfunction, disappointment, divorce, death, you know, all the, all the deadly, all the terrible Ds, but I didn't have that much to say about happiness, joy, what makes for an enjoyable life, what makes for a pleasurable life, what do people most want out of life. But that changed about oh, three decades ago, which seems like a long time, but in the course of science, it's like yesterday. It's not very much time at all when people started studying the science of happiness, taking happiness very seriously as a serious uh, topic, serious business of happiness. And that's what I want to convey to you today, that what at one time seemed to be an optional or a luxury or, or a soft topic actually is a very real, very potent topic. We understand better than ever before, now after roughly 30 years of science, and of course there were scattered studies, you know, decades before, but just really systematically took off about three decades ago. What constitutes a joyful life? What constitutes a meaningful life? What do people really want out of life? And how knowing this and applying this knowledge can be really, really critical, really, really important in life both in dealing with the terrible Ds, but just in living one's best life now, one's most meaningful, fulfilling, enjoyable life. So uh, what I want to do is present the material to you slowly and gradually in the form of a quiz. All right? Uh, I've taught now at UC Davis for some 30 years, and I don't know how many different classes I've taught, but the biggest challenge is always what to do on the first day of class. You know, so many of us kind of get in there and do the same old thing, present the, how the course is going to work, the logistics, you know, go over the, the syllabus and requirements and all that stuff. And I always try to change it up a little bit just to make it a little bit more uh, interesting. So uh, one year I had the brilliant idea, I'll, I'll give a quiz on the first day. Uh, you know, this was, this was health psychology. And there was some debate going on in our department about whether we should require prerequisites for the students. Should they have to take certain more um, fundamental foundational courses before they could take more specialized upper division classes? And uh, they were saying, well, you know, they should have at least a basic knowledge, rudimentary knowledge of, let's say, you know, general psychology or research methods or um, physiology before they take more upper division courses, which are based upon knowing some stuff at a more primary level. And I thought to myself, I didn't say it, but. You know how it is in faculty meetings or committee meetings. You think a lot of things and you rarely say them. Which is a good thing. <laughs> how I lasted there 30 years, I think. Um, they're not going to remember, even if they take the prerequisites. They're not going to remember any of it from you know quarter to quarter, you know, let alone year to year. And I would just teach them what they need to know to do okay in my classes. But anyway, I thought I'd play along just see because I wanted to see how much they already knew on that first day in terms of more basic processes and methods and that sort of thing. Well, the average grade was like, there was 24 questions, the average grade was uh, 12. Right now, I'm not real good at math, but even I know that's a failing grade, right? 12 out of 24. And so, um, I never did that again on the first day because my course evaluations, they weren't that good that year. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it had something to do with it, perhaps, but I like to use quizzes, it gets us thinking, you know, especially the first thing in the morning, and so, here we go, actually, it's gonna, well, it doesn't matter, we reveal it one at a time or all at once. So there's like 10 questions, okay? And you can just think about it if you want to write on your, in your I see you have a, uh, a pad there to write, or just think about it in your mind, it doesn't really matter. There's, there won't be, there's no grading on this, it's just really to get us thinking. These are more rhetorical questions, 
than anything else. All right, so number one, and just your kind of first reaction, right, first impression. Don't do what my students do. I say, well, what do you mean? You mean always, sometimes, you know? You mean, you know it's kind of either true or false. So, uh, number one, you're either naturally happy or not true or false. Number two, young people are happier than older people, true or false. Right? The connection between age and happiness. By the way, I'm not even going to bother defining happiness. I assume most people know we're talking about a more sustained state than a, than a momentary, immediate sense of you know joy or pleasure or happiness. It's more of a long-term, sustainable sense of well-being. I find definitions can be very um, confining and restricting, so I think we pretty much you know, have an idea of what, what happiness is. Uh, married people are happier than singles. It's a connection between you know, marital status and happiness. Thinking about death makes you unhappy. Is that true or is that false? Okay. One of the best ways to be happy is actually to act happy. Like smile, for example, or say happy things. That's sort of All right, here we go. Uh, number six, you're <laughs> more likely to be unhappy if you live in California. That would be compared to other states. So what do we know about the connection between the geography and happy where you live? People are happiest on Fridays and unhappiest <laughs> on Mondays. You see, I think for a lot of these, we have, an, we have an idea. We have some conceptions, some hypotheses. Sometimes those are correct, but sometimes those are actually mistaken. And it's very interesting. We psychologists, you know, get very excited when, when findings are actually counterintuitive. And that's good because that keeps us in business. Otherwise, you just say, well, yeah, if we already knew this. Why bother doing the studies, right? This is just stuff that, you know, our parents knew, our grandparents knew. But in fact, things are not always what we thought they were. Spending money promotes happiness. What's the correlation between money? Not necessarily having money, but, but spending money. Is that related to more or less happiness? Uh, what about how happy you were back in high school, for those of us who can remember that? Does that predict relationship quality? So how happy, how fulfilled, how satisfied do your relationships continue to last, actually persist? Is that connected to how happy you were in uh, childhood? And number 10, the best way to be happy is to consciously work at it. Set a goal, I want to be happy. And is that the best way to actually achieve it? Okay, so each of those is either true uh, or false. Let's move forward. Let's start with this one. And this gives us a little bit of a clue. You kind of just kind of go through and not necessarily in systematic order. Uh, the happiest people in the United States live where? In the Northeast, in the South, on the west coast, or if I was really savvy technologically, we'd do the thing with the little clickers and you can go and see that, but that would take forever, so uh, it doesn't really matter. But how many of you say it's in the Midwest where people are happiest? Right? Kind of like, you know, kind of what you think, right? Less stress, less crowded. I had a friend who, colleague, was moving from Texas to Iowa, and his colleague at the university was in Texas was was a little upset because he was really good and successful and good friends, and he was upset that he was his, family, his colleague was taking his family up to Iowa. And uh, we're trying to explain why to him, and we told him there's less crime in Iowa. And he said, there's less of everything in Iowa. I don't want to go there. <laughs> it turns out they're not there anymore. They moved to Indiana. <laughs> uh, if you pick the South, uh, that would be correct. Okay, listen to this. A study found, listen, southern states are the happiest, while eastern states like New York are at the bottom of the list. Out of 51 slots, California ranked number 46 on the happiness scale. 46. Now, before you say, that can't be, I'm happy, I live in California. Well, we know how science works, right? Science is about trends and statistics and summaries and, and uh, probabilities, right? So for any one of these, there's going to be exceptions, of course, but on average, what the studies show, 
Not all studies show the same thing. We, we kind of like to pull them all together and see what, on average, they have to say. And so the researcher who did the, led this study, and actually he wasn't even in the United States, which is interesting, but if they made, it, made, it, made it more objective, I suppose. University of Warwick in Coventry, England said, many people think these states would be marvelous places to live. They like California, right? But the problem is, if too many people think that way, they move into those states, right? And the resulting congestion, traffic, housing prices, he says, makes it a non-fulfilling prophecy. Right? Interesting. The number one state, the happiest state, is, is this in the South? It's not Florida, because in Florida, too many people from New York move down there. <laughs> and I know that. I used to live in kind of close to both of those places. Louisiana was the happiest state, southern hospitality, right? Okay, it's going to get it's going to get even more interesting. Um, okay, here's a question for you: uh, What makes people happier, sex or money? All right, interesting. Lots of studies have looked at this sort of thing. Can money buy happiness? Right? And what do you have? <laughs> no, no, we're not talking about that. All right. All right studies show that if you said A, you're correct and probably happier. Um, good news, the study said. I have to read quotes from some of these. The way they, they, they uh, phrase these or frame these is just so interesting. Good news for folks whose bedrooms have more activity than their bank accounts. <laughs> Re research shows that sex is better for your happiness than money. Overall, the happiest folks are those getting the most sex married people who report, listen, 30% more between the sheet action than single folks. Right? Um, in my health psychology class, I have a segment on marriage and health. We compare different marital categories, married, single, divorced, never married, cohabitating couples. And one interesting graphic I use in that class shows that although cohabitators actually have sex more often, um, than married people, their fulfillment or their satisfaction, their emotional fulfillment with the actual relationship is less than those who are married. It's like, uh, I think, uh, seven times a month on average for the cohabitators and five and a half for married. So the frequency actually cohabitators were having more sex but were less emotionally satisfied. I think it's what it was, seven and a half uh, and five and a half, which Seems a little high to me, but that's not the <laughs> At what age, so there's a question about age and happiness, right? At what age do you think, when they're young and kind of free and have the future ahead of them, right? Not tied down with obligations and responsibilities so much. So just, just out of these four age groups, 70, 21, 29, 35, 40, 46, or 50, Plus, okay. What do you think? D. 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 That works real good when everybody shouts it out. Okay. Uh, if you said D, you are correct. Yes, that's right. Something to look forward to for some of you. Well, 50 plus, right? So that covers. You think that would not be right, right? It's like as you get older. Right, start to, you know, deteriorate physically, maybe mentally. As you get much older, right, friends are dying and so forth, and you have things going to be an unhappy time of life. I would say that to show that 50, at age 50, people are happier, less stressed, feel better about themselves. This was a study of 350,000 people, so it's pretty systematic, right? You can be pretty confident in the results of that uh, study. Overall feelings of happiness, overall feelings of well-being, which is like happiness minus unhappiness. It's important to look at that balance because you could be like really, really happy but also really, really unhappy, although not at the same time, but in over a long period of time, you just feel more intense, more strong emotions. But the balance is good. It's frequent positive feelings and then less frequent unhappy or negative feelings. That's kind of balance, which is emotional well-being. 
improve as people pass what they say are, is middle age. Negative emotions like stress and anger tend to go down, decline after the early 20s. People over 50 worry less than younger folks, right? Get calmer. I feel that too now. I had a big milestone birthday uh, this year. I won't say which one it is. But I notice as I get older, I just feel calmer, you know? Less stressed, less worried about what other people think. Sometimes I think it's calmer, other times I think I'm just more tired, you know? <laughs> Don't minimize that, that could be good too. Or, well, I, mean, I read this quote, I like this one. The uh, author said, at age 20, we worry about what, what others think of us. At age 40, we don't care what they think of us. At age 60, we realize they haven't been thinking about us at all. <laughs> I think that was Ann Landers that said that, or Dear, Dear Abby, one of those two. Very wise folks. Okay, well, before we go further with the quiz, let's just take a slight detour and talk about why happiness actually matters, right? Sure, we all want it. I mean, most people want to be happy, they want to be sustainably happy, they want their loved ones to be happy. We make decisions and choices about jobs and where to live and who to vote for and what to buy based on what we think will bring us the most happiness. Well, the research over the last few decades has showed that all that is true, but also that happiness matters because it produces or leads to or drives good outcomes in life. Right? It actually leads to superior outcomes across different spheres, different domains. Happy people just are more successful overall in three primary domains. You know, Freud, Sigmund Freud, said that everything really boils down to two things, right? Work and love, and those are two of the three domains, the other one being health and well-being. So when we look at the connection between happiness levels and healthy lifestyles, health and well-being, things like longevity or uh, recovery from disease, recovery from illness, there's a connection. Look at career success and income levels, there's a connection with happiness. And then in terms of relationship duration, relationship satisfaction, there's also a connection with happiness. But it all works in the direction that happiness makes these good things happen. It's not like, you know, you, you get a raise, you get more money, things are going well relationally and so forth, and you feel happier. That can be true for sure, it could be bi-directionality. But in general, the studies show that happiness actually precedes and leads to these outcomes. Like this study, one of my favorite studies was done with college students, and they found that college student levels of happiness when they were, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, predicted their income levels two decades later, right? The happiest undergraduates were making $25,000 more per year than their less happy uh, cohort, colleagues, you know, peers when they were in college. And that was like 2000 a month, right? A lot of money for the undergraduates who were, you know, in their early 30s, probably not making a lot of money yet. So higher income, better work outcomes, so the more productive. Lots of studies looking at the links between happiness and productivity at work, and all the usual sorts of workplace metrics that are measured by those interested in that sort of thing, like uh, engagement and turnover and satisfaction and employee, you know, theft and sabotage is lowered by the people who are happier, and, you know, less disgruntled and all that sort of thing. So uh, that's, that's all good, right? In the area of relationships, so studies find larger social rewards, more satisfying, longer lasting marriages, more friends, stronger support, which well, we know very, very beneficial for physical health, of course, uh, as well as happiness, richer, more meaningful social interactions. Now, I'm going to show you a, a interesting, I don't know if you can read the numbers here, but this is interesting because this speaks to one of those quiz questions. This is actually combining two factors correlating with happiness. One is marriage, and the other is having kids. Right? One of the early findings, which was counterintuitive for a lot of people, was that the connection between having kids and being happy was actually negative correlation. Right? Uh, those with teenagers were not surprised at all. That's perfectly intuitive, nothing counterintuitive about that at all. Uh, and this is a good example of that. This is from a survey of um, 2,500 folks. So you have you can see that you have married and non-married, and then you have parent, non-parent. In these large-scale surveys, they generally ask a single question about happiness. One of the most commonly asked questions is, 
you know, all things, taking all things together, you know, would you say you are very happy, pretty happy, or not too happy? You have three options, right? So happy, unhappy, and kind of uh, in between. This is the percentage saying they are these three, their lives. So two things you notice, right? Two columns. Well, if you compare the married with the non-married, overall, the marrieds are happier, whether they're parents or non-parents, whether they have kids or not, the marrieds are happier on average than the, those who are not married, right? Um, the ones who are the least happy, so they have the lowest rate of uh, being very happy, well, this is about time here, but they have the highest rates of being not too happy, would be the not married parents, so single parents, for example, have lower happiness levels. Okay. The group of for the happiest, 39% very happy, only 9% not too happy, are the marrieds who are not parents, right? So whether they are not yet parents, or whether they're, well, I guess that would only be the only way right? that you would happen. So it's not that the kids have moved out. Uh, however, studies have shown, too, that if you combine this one out with age, and that it, it's too complicated to show graphically, but uh, 50 plus are happier without kids, so you can kind of put it together in your mind, in fact, that the empty nesters uh, are the happiest of all these categories. So, yep. Looking forward to that. Good. I thought I remember hearing that women were happier. Yeah. Uh, okay, the question was about women, men, married. So marriage uh, improves the well-being of both men and women, but, but does so more for men than does so for women. That's true. Okay. Uh, one question I did put on the quiz was the connection between uh, sex or gender and happiness. Studies generally find that women are happier than men, uh, on average overall, but it's a, very, it's a rather small difference. Uh, what about back when you were in high school? You know, there's a lot of interesting studies. Some of the more uh, the, the classic studies in the science of happiness uh, involve predicting later later status, like happiness or relationship quality, from people's yearbook pictures. Like, isn't that weird? Think about it. somebody had this brilliant idea. Let's see if we can uh, understand something about a person's life a few decades later by looking at them when they were in high school. So they actually had a high school yearbook and they, they were able to uh, rate, quantitatively rate, assess how much of a smile a person showed, how intense their smile was, you know, did it look kind of gloomy or stern or have a really smile, smiley happy face, or did it seem like what you call an authentic smile with, you know, lots of facial, lots of muscle movements or less just kind of like, you know, smiling to get your picture taken, that kind of smile, right? and so on. And really, really interesting studies have emerged from about four of these particular studies. One of the most important ones, or interesting ones, was connection between smiling in the yearbook and later relationship duration, right? Those who smiled in the yearbooks uh, didn't smile, smiled the least, right? Kind of serious then. Uh, five times more likely to divorce at some point in their lives compared to those who smiled the most. Right? This was a study done by Matthew Hertenstein, DePaul University, connection between yearbook pictures and later marital. Uh, they wrote about it in a book called uh, The Tell, right? giving clues about later functioning based on early pictures. Right? Really, really interesting. Got a lot of publicity, as you would think, from a study uh, like this. Yep, five times. Uh, another study found it also predicted how long people will, will actually live, right? They did a study, not on yearbook pictures, but they did a study of baseball players and on their baseball cards, you know, and they could, some you know, players look, you know, have the game face on intense and others are, are smiling, more jovial. And they actually found to predict longevity, that the, the players who smile the most live on average seven and a half years more than the players who are more serious. And, there are other studies like that showing that ha happiness actually predicts longer life, longevity, as much as seven or eight more years uh, of life uh, added on from being married, which is about the same amount of time that you lose from life by smoking regularly, right? They say it's about seven to eight years, okay? Uh, 
Um, interesting. So the, the effect sizes for happiness are, are quite substantial, and they actually come very close to some of the other sort of traditional risk factors uh, that we study, you guys study in the field of medicine. Okay, physically, happiness, happy people are healthier on average, right? Again, uh, I mean, everyone dies, of course. I mean, that's a fact. Uh, I tell my students, right, you're going to learn one thing today, that the mortality rate is 100%. You know, I write that down beautifully. Like, you know, think about it. <laughs> you know, right? um, but happy people live a little bit longer. They recover more quickly. And there's lots of studies now showing that positive emotions actually are beneficial physiologically in terms of things like stress hormones, in terms of things like uh, tel telomere lengths on your uh, chromosomes, which is an indicator of uh, aging, recovery from stress, I was like to have stress, uh, recovery more quickly from surgery, have less pain, on and on and on. The usual sorts of clinical outcomes do show a connection with happiness. Okay, let's move on to um, the connection with money. So one of the classic areas was always, what's the connection between income levels and happiness, right? Did having more money make you happier? Some of the early studies found that uh, up to a certain point, it does make a difference, right? If you're at the poverty level, you know, and you don't have enough money, you know, to have three meals a day or live in a dangerous, you know, environment or neighborhood because you can't afford to move to a better place, yeah, then, then the income makes a difference. But once you get above a certain point, right? and years ago they said that that point was $75,000. That was like the magic number for, on average, for people all over uh, this country, right? Once you get above that point, family income levels, it didn't really matter. You could add, you go to 85, 95, 150,000, 150, and you wouldn't be any happier than the people who are at $75,000. Well, another lot of research said, well, it's not so much what you have, but what you do with it, maybe that makes a difference, how you spend the money. And some studies would come out and were interesting, would, would actually assign people, give them some money, small amount of money, and then tell them, okay, you can spend this money on yourself, or you can spend this money on someone else. So I gave them $20 uh, one study, or $10, and say, okay, here's money, you know, spend it on yourself or buy something for someone else. They came back a couple of days later, and they read how happy they were both before and after. Sure enough, found that those who spent money on others were happier than those who spent money on themselves. Right? <laughs> Spending money seems to be happy, especially if it's spent. We like to buy gifts for others, right? And giving is sometimes better than receiving when it comes to happiness. Well, another line of studies made a different distinction. And they said, well, there's different things you can do with your money. You can spend it on things, right? Stuff. You can buy something, right? Car, television, the new iPhone, right? Whatever. Uh, or you can spend it on what they call experiences. You can do things. You can take a trip, go on a vacation, go to a ball game, a concert, a movie do things that are not um, based on getting something, you know, solid material, physical object that you, you know, keep for a while. Those studies seem to support the notion there's more of a lasting effect on the experiential purchases compared to the material purchases. But people don't often recognize that. This uh, table shows that people fail to predict the economic benefits of experiential purposes. Right? So they ask them, before you bought it, and then two weeks after, and then four weeks after, right? People don't think that the experiential purchase uh, is a good use of their money, right? But afterward, they think it's a better use, right? So is that vacation a good use of that? Well, you know, it depends on where you go, what you do, you know? Uh, you think, well, that's gonna be a big uh, investment, and you start pre-vacation, pre because of the way our minds work, they tend to focus on all things that might go wrong. Right, you know, oh, you know, what if the flights are not on time, right? What if it rains the whole time, right? And how expensive the hotel is going to be and, and all that stuff, right? And so even though you had an anticipatory joy, further away from the event, as the event gets closer because the way our moods work, the negative starts to become stronger than the positive. But afterward, in fact, turns out that the post-consumption, the experiential purchase was better in terms of overall happiness than the actual material purchase, which I think can be counterintuitive, right? Because you think, oh, if you buy something, you have it, right? I mean, you know, you buy the car or the, or the shoes or the phone or whatever, and it's there, 
with the experience, it's gone, right? You have it for a few hours, right, or a few days, a week, you know, and then, then it's gone. But actually, they suggest, no, it's just the opposite, right? Maybe the experiential thing, you, you, you know, you, you have more memories of it afterward, right? Even if the vacation was terrible, it rain the whole time when you went to the beach, you know, you stayed in, you played games with the family, and you bonded over that, or something like that. That's how they explain it. You often have more anticipatory joy, too, with experiential ones. And we, we adapt very quickly to the, to the material goods, right? You look forward to the car, right? Whenever I bought a new car, uh, the most joy I got was looking at the glossy brochures you know, before, before they all went online, and now you can't do that anymore. And so I didn't really care even to buy them. Forget the car. I just liked the, the smell, the touch, the look of the brochures, you know, and all the different color combinations, you know. And, oh, it was awesome. And then, you know, the car is great when you get it, and then, you know, you get a scratch the next day, right? And uh, you, you get jaded very quickly. Uh, the, the newness wears off. Psychology has, has discovered that newness wears off. We, we adapt very quickly to good things, new things, no matter what they are, how great they are. Less likely to do so with the experiential purchases. So. This one we've already looked at. And what age people are happiest, right? There you go, you know, top down, convertible, losing all the happiest time of life. What else do we have here? Uh, how about the death study? That's really interesting. Does thinking about death make you unhappy? You want to be unpopular? Bring up the topic of death. You know, at your tables here for the break. Or, uh, over, a, over a romantic date or something. You know, have you given much thought? How are you going to die? <laughs> well, really interesting study. Um, ask people to reflect on death. How do they do that in these experiments? Well, a lot of the experiments, they create a certain mental set. They ask the human a little script to read. Reflect on, you know, uh, you're going to die. They had two different scenarios here. One was uh, ba based on what they've done for near-death experiments, right? Okay. Imagine waking up. Listen to this. This is the death scenario. Imagine waking up in the middle of the night in a friend's apartment on the 20th floor of an old downtown building to the sounds of screams and choking smell of smoke. The scenario de details the participants' futile attempt to escape from the room and burning the building before finally giving in to the fire and eventually death. So kind of imagine being in that situation, right? Have to talk about your thoughts and feelings and so forth. And another one is just what they call the mortality. This is a great term. Uh, lots of studies have used this. They call it the, the mortality salience effect, right? Making mortality salient. How do you make it, you know... Uh, Salient to people, especially, you know, college students who are often in these experiments don't often think about death because they've got many, many decades more uh, to go. And they'll say, you know, think about, in many words as possible, in detail, please describe the thoughts, feelings, and situations, experience, reactions you experience when thinking about your own death. So try to make this salient, you know, put it in their minds. And then they ask questions about, in this case, not happiness, but Gratitude. All right, I lied. I guess I may going to talk about gratitude just a little bit. Um, because we know gratitude and happiness go together. Grateful people are happier. So if they did this experiment with happiness, I think you would see a similar pattern. This was the change in gratitude when they were asked either to think about being in this burning building or making mortality very salient. Uh, this is a controlled condition where they were asked just to... Um, you know, like describe describe your typical day, right? Describe the thoughts and feelings as you go about your typical activities. So a very benign, emotionally neutral, most people controlled condition. And this was the change in happiness or gratitude in this case from before and after, right? Or the control group. So the control group actually decreased. They got less grateful. Uh, and then the two con two other conditions. People became more grateful, more appreciative of life when they realized that, hey, you know, life might be short in comparison. It made it more salient. There's other studies showing that when you think about a positive experience is about to end, it becomes more meaningful. It becomes almost like the, the principle of scarcity, right? If something is scarce, it's more valuable. It's more meaningful. You extract, get more joy and pleasure out of it. So it is with life. You think about life, you might not have it much longer. We know lots of studies on 
people who've had traumatic events or maybe recover from a, a, what thought to be a failed condition, you know, much more joy and meaning and appreciation for life afterward. I think the study is very similar to that. So that suggests that thinking about death doesn't necessarily make you unhappy. In fact, can have the opposite uh, effect. Okay, this is a very important finding. Now, I'm going to have a couple of findings that I put with numbers because there are some of the more, I think, important and kind of neat, cool findings in the science of happiness. One of which is known as the focusing illusion. You know, when people are asked questions in these surveys, the questions and the answers in response to the questions will often vary depending upon the focus, what you're thinking about, what the context is. Right? If you think something is important, it has more weight. It carries more weight when you make the judgment about how happy you are. Really, happiness in these studies really is a judgment. Right? It's a judgment how your life is going. Do you feel it's going the way you'd like? Would you change things if you could do it all over again? Right? And so the question becomes, what information goes into those judgments? What factors? What information do people rely on? What inputs go into making that choice of whether I'm a five or a six or a seven? on the questionnaire. Okay. When you consider a single factor, whether it's sex or money or where you live or whatever it is, your job, we tend to exaggerate, to overestimate its importance. And let me give you a couple of examples of that. First study, before they even came up with the term focusing illusion, then found you, know, you, could, you could understand some discrete findings with this broader principle. They would ask people, and this, again, this was done with college students, what's the correlation? They asked, you know, how happy are you overall? And then how happy are you or satisfied with your love life? Another variation, they said, uh, how many dates did you have uh, in the last month? And now how happy are you? Well, what's really interesting about that is that it makes a difference in which direction you ask the question, what you ask about first. Okay, whether you ask about overall happiness first or specific happiness, the, the results are really, really different. Okay? When the students were asked, how happy are you with your life in general? And then, how many dates did you have last month? There was virtually no correlation between the two, like zero. Right? Because people are making a judgment overall with happiness, and then they're specifically thinking about how many dates. But, when the question was asked the other way around, how many days did you have last month? So now they know what it is. And then they're asked, well, how happy are you, right, overall? The correlation point, six, six, right? It became much more important, much more prepotent for them. This was the focusing illusion, right? It took on great, massive importance, right? So that's really, really important for people who do these surveys and construct questionnaires and the order, the sequence, and the whole body of research on just sequencing effects and, and questionnaires and what you ask about first influences responses to questions that come later down the road. Really, really uh, interesting. Focusing illusion. So you, there's, a, there's a phrase, listen to this. This is what the focusing illusion is. Nothing that you focus on will make as much difference as you think. All right, now let me give a couple of other examples of that. Nothing that you focus on makes as much difference as you think. All right? So they've done studies of uh, people where they've asked people, called people in different parts of the country, and asked, how happy are you? Trying to compare you know, the Midwest, South, Northeast, West Coast, and so on. Most of those studies, despite what I mentioned earlier from those big surveys, don't find a huge difference. Yeah, slight difference uh, on average, different parts uh, of the country. But when you make it salient, like, like, like the context salient, then the correlation gets much stronger. So they did a study, and they, they called up the people, I think, in Ohio, and it was like in the winter, you know, and where it's cloudy, you know, most of the time. I, I lived in Michigan, and basically it was cloudy from November to April. Right now, you know, never saw the sun. And so they would say, okay, we're going to ask you some questions about mood. Do you have time to answer a few questions? Sure, why not, right? Some of those, they'd say, oh, by the way, you know, uh, how's the weather where you are? Okay? When people mentioned, when they were asked what the weather was, and they mentioned it, the weather had a much stronger influence on their ratings, right? So when it was a sunny day, you know, they were a 9 on the 10-point scale. Uh, when it was a cloudy day, you know, they were a 3. 
But when they were asked about the weather, there was like no difference, right? And so it's just what you were focusing on uh, at the time. They did a really cool study, I think, um, comparing people who lived in the Midwest with people who lived in California. And so this was studied again using college students. And they, this was Michigan and Ohio, it was Northern and Southern California. So students at like Berkeley and UCLA and University of Michigan, the Ohio State University. And now they ask, not just how happy you are, but how happy do you think people are who live in the other place, all right? So they asked the California people, the students, how happy do you think are people who live in Ohio and Michigan? And of course they said, oh, they're miserable, right? <laughs> and so on. And they asked the Midwesterners, you know, the, the Wolverines and the Buckeyes, how happy are, do you think people in California are? Is all oh, they're really happy. Right? And, that's part, and it turns out that there was very, very little actual difference in the happiness levels between the students in these two different states. And it's one of those because what they were focusing on, they thought that the climate, the location, would make all the difference if you're not there, right? And so on. And so, you know, it's interesting. It's like one of these focuses, right? It's what you think is important, not necessarily is important. I always like that study, especially because I have friends all over the country. So I, I like them to think that I'm happy because I live in California. You know, you know, they may be. I don't know. But that's another one of these sorts of very, so context does matter, Midwest, West Coast, uh, and so on. OK. There was a question in the quiz uh, about working to be happy. Remember that one? If you want to be happy, you should set a goal of trying to be happy. OK. Turns out that's false. Okay, that's one of the myths about happiness. You think, well, it should work, right? If you, if you want to achieve something, isn't the thing to do? Set a goal for it, right? And work toward it. You know, you, you've heard the ABCs of goal attainment, right? First, you, you conceive of the idea, right? And then you believe you can do it, and you actually go out and, and you achieve it, right? And so on. But it doesn't seem to work that way when it comes to happiness, right? In fact, trying to be happy, putting maybe too much emphasis on being happy actually backfires, okay? It actually works against your becoming happier, right? And studies have shown that pursuing happiness actually has the opposite outcome. It takes you further away from that goal than making progress toward that. Actually, that works the way that gratitude does, but I mentioned that last year uh, toward the end of the talk, that trying to be grateful can backfire because you become so consumed with how you're doing your performance, you know? Am I grateful today? Am I more grateful than I was yesterday but, but than the other person and so on? And by, by definition, gratitude is focusing on other people, not on your own performance. Happiness works the same way. Happiness follows from other activities, not focusing on how well you're actually doing. Because what happens is that you, you, you tend to set very unrealistic standards for happiness. Well, I need to be a 10 today. Right? Because uh, that's what they say. Happiness is good for me, so I should be, this is where I should be. Uh, I look around at what other people are doing. You know, I want my life to, to be as good as my friends' lives appear to be on Facebook uh, and so forth. And, uh, that could be difficult. Compare yourself to other people. Right? They show that, studies show that envying your friends' posts on Facebook can actually lead to depression. All right? You know, their vacation photos, their successful children, right, uh, so on and so forth, their, their, their proclamations of success, right, and all that stuff, you just like, hmm, wow, because uh, I'm not doing so well, and so on. So that's an example of number two, which is we can often engage in activities which are counterproductive or self-defeating when it comes to happiness. Also, people who set this as a goal, when you set it as a goal, it's in your mind all the time, right? So you become obsessed with it, almost sometimes you could even become neurotic with it. Well, how am I doing? I need to read the latest book, go to the latest talk. What's the latest tips? How to be happy, you know, in 30 days, or seven secrets, 10 steps, three hours, and I'm in a hurry. Yeah, you know, it just works against it. And I'll give you, a, at the end, what I think is the best formula for happiness. And so we have a chart that looks like this, that shows that in the pursuit of happiness, there's two pathways, right? And the top one results in lower happiness, right? High standards, counterproductive actions, mo constantly monitoring your emotional state, whereas the bottom three 
lead to greater happiness on average, greater likelihood. You know, obviously there's going to be exceptions, but this is in general. Manageable standards. Well, you know, what can I extract out of this situation to be happier right now and not worry about other people or how happy I used to be or how happy I can be when I get this promotion or when I move here, when I retire, whatever. Focus now on the present. Engage in productive actions rather than counterproductive actions and then avoid monitoring one's emotional state. Right? There's a really good classic illustration years and years ago that I like. This was people trying to lose weight. Okay? Weight loss, one of the you know, uh, health behaviors that people will often engage in. Kind of like a New Year's res resolution type thing. You know, We're kind of bad at those too. And I think there's some uh, clues here why that might be the case. What if you monitor your weight loss on a regular basis, right? Weigh yourself regularly, you know, two, three times a day and so on. They did a comparison, right? Do that sort of thing. They did a comparison between people who did this regularly, okay? Over a 12-week period, two groups of people, the monitors and the non-monitors. The non-monitors came at once at the beginning of the study, came back, you know, three months later, saw what their weight was, and there were others who uh, I think the monitoring group, they weighed themselves not, not that many times a day, but I think it was at least once a day or so, right? Turned out that the group who didn't monitor themselves really had no idea how they were doing. I mean, they maybe they did subject, they didn't have the objective data to back up. Actually, were more successful at losing weight than the frequent monitors who were like more obsessing about it uh, and so on. In fact, the group who were monitoring it, they actually gained two and a half more pounds over the 12 weeks compared to the non-monitors. It suggests that you know, it's self-defeating uh, to, to constantly focus on attaining the goal and maybe led to less productive uh, activities. Really, really interesting. Okay, what else do we have to talk about? Taylor, how much time do we have? Oh, we've got some time. Okay, 13 minutes. Okay, so let me talk about this. So this is the third most important or interesting finding uh, going after the focusing illusion and then counterproductive. Here's the notion of minds that wander. You know, our minds can either be focused on what's going on in a media situation or they can be totally unrelated to what's happening in the situation, right? We can, we can spend a lot of time thinking about things which are not even happening right now in the immediate context. And we do that as people because we have these big brains, right? We can think about things that are happening in the future, things that are happening in the past, and not really focused on the, the current situation. Some of you, your minds might be wandering right now. <laughs> we, we can do that. So the, what they've done, they've, they've, they've connected this to happiness levels. Wandering minds versus minds that don't wander. And so another one is really, really interesting uh, findings. Uh, how they do this? Well, they created a, a special uh, iPhone application that contacted people randomly during the course of the day and asked them several questions related to what they were doing, whether they were thinking about what they were doing, whether they were thinking about other activities separate from what they were doing, okay, how often their minds wandered, how are you feeling right now, from you know, zero to 100, right? what are you doing right now, would you rather be doing something else, are you doing something other than what you're thinking about something other than what you're currently doing at the time, so all these very interesting questions found out that minds wander almost half the time. 47% of the samples found that mind wandering was occurring. And at least 30% of the samples during every activity, here's, I don't know if you could read that little, the way they did the diagram was kind of interesting in the article. Mind wandering turns out to be the default, more common uh, than not. Uh, the little circles are, that should, the, the size of the circle indicates how frequently or what percent of the population was doing that. So the biggest was mind not wandering, right? But so there was more than 50%. And then here's the activity. So people were working uh, was the most common activity. And then other activities, doing housework, listening to the radio, talking, having a conversation was really, really big. And then really small things were like uh, walking or playing or listening to music. Praying, meditating was the least frequent activity, and that's got the smallest circle. And then this is the happiness level, how happy people were when they were doing those different activities. Uh, from Again, we're going from 0 to 100. 
So here's when you're in an unpleasant mood and your mind is wandering. That was like the least happy experience for people. Right? Whereas, what do we have over here? What does that say? <laughs> Making love. I knew that. I've just seen you did that. Uh, <laughs> strangely, oddly, that's when people were happiest and their minds tended not to wander to them. Uh, <laughs> occasionally, but uh, generally they didn't. Um, so, maybe what this study showed, main findings, right? Very interesting, okay? Minds wander frequently about half the time, okay? People are less happy when their minds wander. People are happier when their minds are more focused or at least consistent with what they're doing uh, at the time. What people were thinking was a better predictor than what they were actually doing. So thoughts were a better predictor than actually activities. And mind wandering seems to cause an unhappiness because they could actually parse it out temporally. You think, well, when you're unhappy, or your mind tends to wander, right? You're unhappy, so you start to daydream or whatever. It turns out it's the other way around. It's, 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 the, it's the mind wandering causing unhappiness rather than unhappiness causing mind wandering. So obviously this suggests that a, a focused mind, a mind that's less wandering, is going to be happier. Again, at the end, I'll give you the, the studies that show a good way to focus the mind to achieve greater happiness. You may have heard of this if you are familiar at all with any of the happiness research. The researchers talk about the 40% solution, given that 50% of our happiness tends to be predetermined. Uh, set point, have you heard about the set point for happiness? The notion that roughly about half on average of our happiness is kind of set in stone, it's kind of determined by genetics, by temperament, you know? So there's a question on the quiz. People are either naturally happy or not. Well, that's one of those that doesn't have a clear, true or false answer. Because in a sense, yes, some of it is determined. That is 50%, but there's another 50% that you can do something about. 10%, they say, is due to circumstances, things which we have less control over, like where we live. You can change that, but not that easily. Age, can't change that, right? Uh, other factors that predicted, you know, income levels, uh, gender, and so forth, all that adds up only to about 10%. doesn't make a huge, whopping difference. The part we can do a lot about, though, is the 40% of the pie, which are intentions and activities, things we do, behaviors, that have a lot to do with how happy we are going to be, like the experiential purchases, for example, which would fall into the green part of the pie under intentions. But set point, 50%, is a lot. It's much like um, you think of intelligence as a set point, you know, and you can learn things and so forth and move along that continuum. Uh, weight, weight is a good example, right? Uh, people have a set point for weight, and their weight can vary across their lifetime, but you tend to be around, roughly around that set point. And circumstances happen, right? Good stuff happens, bad stuff happens. But we return back to what they say is this, this set point, this baseline for overall happiness. So here's a diagram that shows this. Over time, here's your happiness level, here's your set point, the straight line. All right? Pleasant events happen, right? Success, joys, good things, right? Victories of various sorts. Bad stuff happens, illness, death, little stuff, both little stuff as well as big stuff. You, your mood goes down, but then it comes back up. Goes down, comes back up. Mood is like that, right? It goes up, and it goes down. But it tends to vary along a person's set point. Okay? Think of this as like one person. Someone else, maybe their set point is way up there, right? They're happier. Somebody else, way down there. They're going to have a similar oscillation based on events, but eventually they're going to go back to this set point because of what they call hedonic adaptation, which I mentioned earlier. It's this recovery, this going back, getting used to stuff, whether it's good or bad. We get used to the bad stuff, which is good, yes, then we recover. But also the good stuff, though, we get used to that, which uh, may keep us you know, motivated and inspired to achieve more. But if we know that, we also maybe can delay that eventual ha uh, habituation or adaptation as well. So that's another very interesting finding from the science of happiness. So I'm just giving you a bunch of stuff uh, that I think is interesting that has been discovered. I think we made it through most of those questions. Um, let's see. 
The one that we didn't talk about, I think, was the you can you can um, make make yourself happier by acting happy. Right? That's actually true, by the way. Many people think that the, the behavior change must follow your attitude change, that the outer behavior follows inner behavior, right, or inner thought. So you can't really express gratitude unless you're deeply, you know, genuinely authentically grateful. Well, that's false. Anybody can say thank you, right, and so on. Uh, so it is with happiness, right? Studies have shown that if you act happy, you actually will become happier inside, right, just by smiling. Or not even doing something that you think is smiling. This is great research they did, classic studies. They had people pose facial expressions, right? Uh, and then say, you know, act happy, right? Because then obviously that would contaminate the results when they read how happy they were. They would have them take, you know, I'm not going to do it, uh, but take a, like an implement, like an instrument, like a pen or a pencil, and hold it either in their teeth or in their lips. Hold it in your teeth, it activates the smiling muscles. Hold it in your lips, it activates the frowning muscles. People are unhappier when they're holding it in their lips and happier when they're holding it in their teeth, right? Because the feedback goes from your muscles to your brain and then tells you how happy or unhappy you are. So just acting happier can make you happy. By smiling has an impact, not just individually, but also obviously socially. When you smile, just walk past people and smile, right? They'll think you're weird, but they also will tend to smile and so forth if they're looking at you. All right, I've got five minutes to go. So let me tell you about one of the most reliable pathways, strategies for happiness. Concept several decades ago was first uh, discovered, I guess, or made popular by the Hungarian psychologist Csikszentmihalyi. Csikszentmihalyi, Csikszentmihalyi. His uh, first name is part of his last name, actually. Um, very famous psychologist. He goes by the name of Mike for some reason. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and he actually, this is very inspiring. He like has retired twice. He retired from the University of Chicago when he was like 65 years old. Then he moved to Claremont Graduate University in Southern California. He taught there for 20 years. He just retired again at 85. You know, I don't know where he's going to go for the next 20, but um, he obviously practices what he preaches. He talks about a concept known as flow. Okay. Flow. What does it mean to be in flow? Well, flow is a state where you're totally immersed in what you're doing at the time. Okay. You're completely involved, caught up, immersed in an activity, which is, is pleasurable, it's enjoyable, but it's not easy, he says. You're stretched, you're using your talents, you're using your abilities uh, some way. Right? It's an optimal state. So he wrote a book, uh, 19 of 2000 it came out on flow, psychology of optimal experience. When we're trying to accomplish something difficult, something worthwhile, we're stretched to our limits, is what he's saying. It's a wonderful feeling, he says, it's the best thing in life. People will describe this, whether they're you know, playing a sport, playing a musical instrument, having a conversation, teaching a class, performing surgery, climbing a mountain. It's like all these different activities elicit this experience of flow, which has five components to it. The most important one is that you're really caught up in the activity. Your concentration is focused. Your mind can't wander in this situation. You lose awareness of yourself, which is an interesting one. You're not really thinking about how you're doing or how you look while you're doing it. You know that you've all had these experiences in different situations. And what happens is that time starts to go really, really fast in these situations. You kind of lose awareness of time, right? It's like, you know, you think that, you know, 10 minutes has gone by and it's been uh, much longer, right? And so on. Subjective experience is altered and you engage the activity just because it's enjoyable. He would say, not because you're doing it, you know, to uh, make more money or to get someone's <coughs> approval or affection or to be happier. It just happens. Happiness happens while you're doing these activities. And here's a variety of different things. Playing an instrument. I and mean, he's interviewed people who, you know, masters of like, you know, piano or violin or sculptors or artists or writer. People on a seminar is putting cars together. Right? That's kind of boring drudgery work, you know, but. They can experience flow doing that, and when they do so, they experience much more joy, satisfaction, fulfillment at what they're doing. Studying, right? Immerse yourself in a topic. How many times do you start to study something? I knew as a student, 
I've been a student forever. Uh, I never wanted to leave college, you know, when I graduated, so I didn't. I just kept teaching, you know, at UC Davis. And so a lot of times, you, know, you have to read something, you don't really want to do it, but then you, you get yourself into it. It's like, this is interesting, right? Uh, you stop, stop looking at the clock, and you say, wow, you know, this is really meaningful. Gardening, running, all these things, Csikszentmihalyi says, can be opportunities for flow. But what makes them opportunities for flow is that there's a match. This is critical. A match between the challenge in the situation and our skills in that situation. We have flow if we're in this, what he calls the flow channel, when the challenge matches the skills, right? If we're doing an activity that we're overskilled for, overqualified for, right, and the challenge is not there, we're going to get bored very quickly, right? You know, you're, you're, a, you're a, a scratch golfer, you know, and you're playing, you know, uh, at an easy nine-hole course, right, and so on. It's boring for you, right? It's not that interesting. Okay. Uh, if over here, now your skills are low, the challenge is high, right? Now you're playing, you're this golfer, now you're playing, you know, at, uh, you know, uh, Augusta National, you know, Masters course, or you're playing tennis against Serena Williams or something, right? Someone good like that. It's like, I, there's no way I can compete, right? Now I have anxiety, I panic, because the skill and the challenge don't match. So this is what you want. Whether you're here or here, the higher you go, the more likely you are to have this flow experience. And so, Chik Sen Mahai, in the book, and me, I'll finish with one quote from him, and then we'll be all done. The flow book, right? Listen to this. He's, this and he studied happiness all his life. Happiness is not something that happens. It's not the result of good fortune or random chance. It's not something that money can buy or power command. It does not depend on outside events, but rather on how we interpret them. Happiness, in fact, is a condition that must be prepared for, cultivated, and defended privately by each person. Here's the key. People who learn to control inner experience will be able to determine the quality of their lives, which is as close as any of us can come to being happy. It's the control of inner experience is all we can do, because we can't control events happening to us, but we can control our interpretation of them, right? There he is, uh, age 85, looking for another job now. <laughs> it is how we choose what we do, how we approach it, that will determine whether the sum of our days adds up to a formless blur or to something resembling a work of art. So, I think that's a good, a good thing to end on, right? Work of art, right? It's a choice we have, he says. And the way to do it is by creating these flow experiences. Thank you very much.